Warning, by the time I finish this sentence, this podcast will already have started using words like fuck. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Movement Watches and by Fuck You's Giving, the new family holiday where we just drop the pretenses and get it out of the way. Fuck You's Giving, because Aunt Kathy is just a shitty person. And now, The Scathing Atheist. It's November 25th. And if anyone at your Thanksgiving dinner defends Kyle Rittenhouse, it's legal for you to murder them. That's the law. Very, two votes. That's very threatening. the law. threatening when they do that. Yeah, I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. I'm going to add one more vote. And from Bill O'Reilly's <laughs> New Jersey, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Waycross, Georgia, this is The Skating Atheist. On this week's episode, there are worse times to be an atheist, but not by much. The best Thanksgiving food is stuffing, and the rest of you are absolutely wrong. <laughs> and we'll watch a cartoon about people dying en masse from starvation. But first, the diatribe. I hope it's about stuffing. What a person hates tells you a lot about what they fear. Just a thought that may or may not help you as you try to recover from your Thanksgiving dinner. See, the last time I had a big religious argument was at Thanksgiving, and it's the reason I don't do that shit anymore. Yeah, big religious arguments. I still do Thanksgiving. but So I got baited into it by an in-law that coaxed me in with the promise of a rational discussion. He was just curious what I believed and had some questions about it. He didn't want to fight about anything. He just wanted to understand what the atheist position was. Or at least that was his cover story, and I was too new to vocal atheism to know any better, so I, I took his sucker's bet and I started answering his questions. Of course, they, they weren't really questions so much as argument prompts. He had some little gotcha flow chart in his head that was supposed to lead me to Jesus, but he knew that if he said, I want to convince you to join my religion, I wouldn't have played along. But this was about 12 years ago, so it's kind of the height of the four horsemen counter-apologetics. I was way more prepared for the conversation than he was expecting. So not only did I have answers to all his silly ass questions, but I knew where he was trying to go with them. And I was able to deflate a lot of his follow ups before he even got around to following up. Now, keep in mind, of course, this is all playing out in a house full of people. It starts off as a one on one conversation, but it's not just me and my brother in law in isolation. So pretty soon other people start insinuating themselves into the conversation. And instead of answering a few questions about the atheist position, I'm in a six against one argument about whether Grandma Lawrence is in heaven. What's more, I I'm kind of new to this shit, so I don't know any better than to keep winning. So like a 45 year old Noah would have at a certain point in the discussion in the unlikely event he bothered to participate in that kind of discussion at all, pretend to be stumped. Right. Like he'd throw him a bone, he'd shrug his shoulders and he'd offer some disingenuous olive branch along the lines of, well, I guess none of us can know for sure. But early 30s, Noah didn't know any better. So he just kept dunking on Jesus over and over and over again. And at a certain point, of course, shit gets emotional. Women are sad. Men are also sad, but they're too toxically masculine to admit that that's what's going on. So they pretend that they're just mad at me for making the women sad. One of my wife's aunts literally cries. And I experienced probably for the first time that feeling you get when your very existence makes people sad. Really, I, I get she was crying because of some combination of hating conflict and having to contemplate her own mortality, but the reason she had to do that is because I existed and admitted it in public. Now, since then, I've, I've gone out of my way to avoid religious debates. I, I know that seems like an odd statement given that after that I started an atheist podcast, but it's not like we've ever used the podcast for debate. Yes, we present arguments in favor of atheism and we pick apart arguments in favor of theism, but mostly we just turn to other atheists and say, hey, sorry people are sad about your existence. 
Of course, just because I learned my lesson doesn't mean y'all did. And and given when this episode is coming out and when most of you get around to downloading the Thanksgiving episodes, it stands to reason that at least a few of you are listening to this in the aftermath of some angry brother-in-law and some crying auntie. Many of you are listening to this after being asked by well-meaning peacemakers if you could just pretend not to exist for Aunt Kathy's sake for a little bit. And the message I want to send you away with is the reminder that what people hate tells you a lot about what they fear. Now, I I get that a lot of you come from like these religiously homogenous families. Everybody's a Mormon in your family. Everybody's like this one particular slice of Baptist. Everybody goes to this one particular church and always has. But for most of you, there's some variety in your family's religion, right? Like, you know, maybe they're all Christian, but some of them are Episcopalians. A few of them are Catholic. Some of them are Southern Baptists. Maybe there's even like a neo-pagan hippie with some weird bullshit nature Jesus thing going on. That's how my family is. And somehow all of them can peacefully coexist without anybody getting pissed off and crying. Nobody even bothers to broach the subject of which of their mutually exclusive takes on religion are correct. But you toss one atheist into the mix and that changes everything. People want to argue. People want to disprove. And when they can't succeed in that, they get angry and sad and emotional. And why is that? Right? I mean, Catholic theology and Protestant theology are irreconcilable. There are plenty of wars out there to back me up on that. According to Catholics, Protestants are going to hell. According to Protestants, Catholics are going to hell. That's way worse than the just dying that atheism condemns them to. And yet they can have Thanksgiving together with no issues, even when it comes time to say grace and invoke God. Now, I understand that's not true in all places at all times, but in like modern American culture and that of pretty much the entire rest of the English speaking world, that's the case. The subject almost certainly won't come up, and if it did, it's way less likely to ruin everybody's meal than atheism is. And that's because Catholics in modern-day America don't spend any time considering how likely it is that Baptists are right. Baptists don't look at themselves in the mirror, realize that Catholicism makes way more sense, and then push that thought out of their head. Nobody at your Thanksgiving dinner really fears that some other type of religion is the right one, but they all fear atheism. And they all know on some level that their religion is bullshit and anything that threatens that carefully cultivated illusion needs to be banished or at the very least apologized for. Now, I'm not saying this is universally true. There are plenty of Christians that are married enough to their sect to hate all other forms of Christianity. There are plenty of religious fundamentalists that would greet atheism and, you know, ever so slightly different Christianity with the same vitriol. And of course, xenophobia will fuck this metric right up if the religion is mostly reserved for some other ethnic group. But on the whole, it's a pretty good heuristic for what they actually believe. You know, much in the same way that the most vocal homophobes always turn out to be gay, the people most furious about your atheism are, generally speaking, the ones closest to being convinced by it. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast and bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the food and football to my family, Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, you ready to give thanks? Oh, I love this holiday right. so much. It's based on food and football. Uh Uh-huh, and that's the first time someone has called me football without adding shapes. So thank you, Noah. I am grateful. (laughs) You are welcome. Now, quick before we get started, I have a reminder. We have extended Vulgarity for Charity to November 29th because, well, damn it, we want to beat what we did last time, and we are so fucking close. close. As of this record, we have raised over $140,000. That means $280,000 total for modest need. With our anonymous donors match, yes, that has been extended to however much we can raise before the 29th is over. So if you are waiting to give or you already gave, but you can toss in a couple extra bucks, now would be the perfect time to do it. And while you get that donation in, we're going to pause for a quick word from this week's sponsor, Movement. Do it. Come on. Hey, podcast listener. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. I'm No Illusions. We're introducing ourselves again, and we're here to talk about the scourge across our nation that is... Lame gifts for dudes. That's right. We're tired of nodding and smiling at your socks and underwear. Sure, we can be a little hard to shop for because of our extremely specific weird hobbies. Or the fact that we buy stuff when we want it. Well, that's why there's Movement Watches. They're bringing you the sleekest, most quality gifts of the season with hundreds of watches and fine jewelry styles to choose from. Stuff your stockings, impress your family, wow your partners, or just treat yourself. 
because we know you're dressing up with the perfect gift from Movement. And Movement is making it easy. Beautiful curated gift boxes, his and hers gift guides, and free and quick shipping right to your door just in time for the holidays. Movement sent us a watch to try when they became a sponsor, and I get compliments on it all the time. And I never get compliments, ever. He doesn't. Be the big winner this holiday season with a gift from Movement. Just go to movement.com slash scathing. That's M-V-M-T dot com slash scathing. Join the movement. About anything, ever. Okay, just no. relax. Ever. And now, back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, Humanist International just released their 10th annual Freedom of Thought report, and it turns out thought is not particularly free. Not as freedom. <laughs> <laughs> the report found that humanists were discriminated against in 144 of the 195 countries that they ranked. And to be clear, by the standards they're using, the United States of federal tax dollars buying Bibles is one of the 51 non-discriminatory countries. So... And three quarters of the world's nations are at least worse than the United States in terms of discrimination against the non-religious. Whoo, yeah. And the other ones, they buy the Bibles and then they launch them at us out of a cannon. <laughs> right. In lots of the world, atheists would be happy to buy a Bible and punch themselves in the face with it instead of whatever the official government policy is. <laughs> that would be great to most of those. Athe Everyone still has a face at the end of that. Yeah, Right. So now we've talked about this report before, of course, but I think a quick refresher is in order. The Freedom of Thought report rates every country in the world in terms of how they treat self-identified atheists, agnostics, humanists, freethinkers, and non-religious people along four broad categories. Constitution and government, education and children's rights, freedom of expression, and then sort of a catch-all culture category that they dub family, community, society, religious courts, and tribunals. So each of those categories gets a color-coded grade between grave violation in dark red to free and equal in green. So, for example, the U.S. gets a free and equal in education and freedom of expression, a mostly satisfactory, that's yellow, in constitution and government, and a rating of systematic discrimination or orange in the culture category. Yeah, and we should point out that Pretty much all the places that the U.S. does well, it does so because they only kind of mean the laws they have against us. Right, yeah, the laws against us aren't enforceable, exactly. So the key takeaway from this whole thing is, I, I think, is that shit is getting worse. Quote, in recent years, there has been an increase in attacks and persecution of humanists and other non-religious people across the globe. There have been murders, arrests, and disappearances of outspoken humanists in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and India. There are state sponsors crackdowns on the non-religious communities in Egypt and Malaysia, end quote. Of course, I don't want to leave everybody with the impression that discrimination against non-believers is limited to a few theocratic outposts. The report says right up front that, quote, the overwhelming majority of countries fail to respect the rights of humanists, atheists, and the non-religious, end quote. And these failures include restrictions on the rights of citizenship, the right to marry, the right to self-identify, access to public education, access to employment, ability to work for the state, ability to hold office. And, and that's on top of the more restrictive regimes that just imprison and or execute us. Guys, maybe we should merge with the far right. Those guys get all the voting rights. Right? I hear it goes great for them. <laughs> also, just a quick review of our representation. About 25% of the U.S. has no religious affiliation. And that's supposed to be represented by 4% of the Senate, for yeah. example. And that four number is actually high. We have four senators who don't specifically list a religion, but they have them, probably, one was baptized as an Episcopalian. One was raised with Christianity and Judaism. One still identifies as a deist sometimes. Boo, boo. And one is cursed in fucking sin. Yeah, That's boo. our team right. in the Senate. And it's because even moderate religious people hear atheist candidate and they think about horns and orgies of violence all of a sudden. Like in a bad way. Right. Well, yeah, exactly. That, like, <laughs> that's what they think of. And they think, I will not vote for that person. Yeah, clearly. So we'll have the report linked in the show notes, and I'd strongly urge you to peruse it if you have the time. If you've been in the atheist movement for a while, it helps to occasionally pull back and remind yourself just how much work there is to do worldwide. And if you're newer to the movement, the scope of the problem may not have even occurred to you yet. Uh, and I'd especially encourage our international listeners to take a look because it, we're pretty U.S. centric on the show for obvious reasons. Oh, it's because America's where all the Chuck E. Cheese's are. Clearly. Yeah, obviously. But I feel like it would be really easy to get the impression that, you know, 
countries like Australia, Canada, and the UK would say outrank us on scales like the ones they use in this report. Turns out they don't. And some of that might be because the atheists in those countries are busy being thankful that they aren't as bad as the U.S. <laughs> and in Southern hospitality news, if you've been listening to our podcast for a while, you're aware of a couple of things. First of all, I'm the adorable one, sort of the rap scallion of the cast. The second thing you might know is that one of the lesser and more you terrifying like nut loaf, whatever. <laughs> the worst. Rap I knew it would make it in. Like nut loaf. I knew Gross. it would make it in. Well, one of the lesser known and more terrifying aspects of the theocratic hellscape we inhabit is just how many of our nation's hospitals are run by religious institutions. As a result, things like life saving abortive care or hell, even just Health care that requires removing baby making parts can be hard or impossible to find. And while in the past we focused specifically on the issue as it applies to hospitals run by the Catholic Church, thanks to a new report out of Columbia University this week, we learned that down south, it's just fucking all the hospitals, even the secular ones. There is literally no escape from the theocracy. Yeah. Yeah. You may not have noticed this because so few Americans can afford Healthcare, one way or the other, but they checked and it's not. <laughs> yes, they did. Accurate. Yeah. So this report comes to us from Columbia Law School's Law, Rights and Religion Project, which I can only assume is partnered with the Mice, Birds and Cats Project. <laughs> it's the result of a thank you. It's a result of the two year study and it's titled The Southern Hospitals Report. Faith culture, and abortion bans in the U.S. South. There's another wow. one, yeah. <laughs> Mice, birds, and cats. Did not yeah. expect that to come after you. It's a hospital's report and then not hospital words at all. <laughs> yeah, and hey, spoilers for the project. Uh, it sucks ass down there. It sucks ass. Ah, it's a good thing there was a study to let us know. Yeah, good, good thing. Hey, Columbia, uh, no need to buy all the beakers and isolate the variables. <laughs> <laughs> you can just listen to our show for free if you yeah. want or like read a single newspaper. Yeah, I don't know. Nice <laughs> it's a dumb study. <laughs> We're here for you. Yeah. So this report is actually well worth a read. It's only 77 pages long, but it's scary like a Stephen King novel. So it's a real page turner, I promise. Mm. But the main takeaways are four points. One, it's not just Catholic hospitals. Protestant run hospitals are banning the fuck out of abortion as well. Oh, I'm surprised Protestant hospitals aren't banning Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Just when I thought Protestants were super woke and helpful. Right. Yeah. <laughs> big letdown like this. Thanks, Columbia. <laughs> Very disappointing. I'm sorry you had to find out this way. <laughs> so number two, when they say Protestant run hospitals, they mean Protestant run hospitals. Quote. While Protestant hospitals are typically no longer owned by religious institutions, they are not religious in name only, as some advocates and doctors initially suggested to us. Rather, these systems have retained important connections to their founding denominations, typically through rules allowing religious groups to nominate or approve members of their board of trustees, end quote. Wow. Yeah. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, OK, Eli, that's bad, but people can still get their abortive care at secular hospitals, right? Nope. Number three, secular hospitals in the South ban abortion too. Quote, abortion bans have also been installed at many public hospitals in the South due to a variety of factors, including legal prohibitions, anti-choice boards or administrators, fear of losing public or private funding or community pressure. Yeah. End quote. Right. I'm, I'm glad they included those last two people. I know nobody wants to have to be the asshole, but it's worth remembering that a lot of the time Christianity gets their way because they're the biggest pain in the ass to deal with. Mm hmm. Yeah. And last, but certainly not least, for number four, I'm just going to read the quote from the report here because this is so fucking crazy. Many hospitals use termination of pregnancy committees or boards to evaluate patients and determine whether a doctor can perform a medically indicated abortion in the facility. I'm sorry, th that committee is not the doctor and the mother? No, 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 no. It's other people? It continues. Great. Some committees at religious health systems include faith leaders. Wow. And then to really hit this home, they conclude such committees were common in the pre-row era, end quote. Oof. Yeah. Yikes. That's right. Many hospitals still have a can you kill your baby committee populated by priests and pastors, just like we did with the original Nintendo wasn't out yet. <laughs> 
I'd love it if when Noah was a kid didn't sound so fucking medieval <laughs> and hadn't been so fucking medieval. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so you know how slavery got banned, but bigotry didn't go away? It's like that. Christian people have been running reconstruction hospitals since 1973, apparently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What the fuck? So, yeah, this is obviously all terrifying and words like there is no escape come to mind. But I bring this up because policies like this are the stuff that regular people, you know, the ones who like roll their eyes at you when you talk about atheism, they, they don't know about this. And that's the way religion wants it, right? They They want to seem like cozy buildings full of nice little old ladies, not billion dollar rape cabals stopping literally all the abortion below the makes and dixon line so we got to keep talking about this even if people's eyes are rolling and we got to keep fighting it yep and in a state of mind news tonight self-described prophetess <laughs> and where are they now troll doll cat Kerr takes time. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Took time off of pitching celestial timeshares to Steve Schultz to deliver a sermon at the Glory Fire Church in suburban Orlando last weekend. And during the sermon, she explained that God bought her a house as a thank you for all the acid trip in a county fair heaven descriptions that she's been given out. <laughs> That's her job. Yep. And then she bragged about how much bigger her house is than the people who whose money she takes. Hmm. And then she explained that God was really just giving her a mansion so she could insinuate herself into rich people company okay. and see what those devil worshippers are up to. Just say Jewish people, Kat Kerr. Don't be a fucking <laughs> coward. We know what you're fucking saying. Say Jewish. All right. So, okay, so here's the quote. Quote, if you've been faithful to God, you cannot escape being blessed in these days. He told me to go pick out as many houses as I wanted. He didn't care. She only wanted one. She went with one? Right, yeah. She went with one. He Weird. didn't care where they were. So she went with Florida, apparently. This is, oh, she got all of these questions wrong. Continuing the quote, he didn't care what they cost and I'm getting one. End quote. And, and then, Perhaps sensing that I have more money than you is not a good lead into the collection plate portion of the program. She explained that this was really all part of her divine mission. Quote, he said, and that he is God, of course. He said, I will infiltrate you into the circles of the wealthy and the rich. It's another assignment. I hope they're ready. End quote. Okay. I, I just want to make sure I have this right. God of the universe needed somebody to infiltrate the evil Jewish rich people. Mm -hmm. Yep. S someone who, you know, blend right in with that group. Yep. <laughs> that her, who looks like a sorceress of Pepto-Bismol. <laughs> yep. It's a Bismol bender. The only issue, the only issue was getting her a big house that wouldn't arouse right, yeah. suspicion. <laughs> I'm just thinking about the nosy neighbor who's like, hun, I think that lady who looks like she played hit girl in the retirement home production of Kick-Ass is probably a spy <laughs> for God. Look at Linda. Get away from the window. Okay, Linda? Get away from the window. Well, my favorite part is the contradiction, right? She like, with the assurance that people get rich because God decides to reward them still hanging in the fucking air. She claims that she's only there so that a godly person can sneak in among all those satanic rich people. And, and of course, if she's not lying about moving into a mansion, it'll be the first non lie she's ever told into a microphone. But that being said, <laughs> heaven has a three mile slip and slide made of gold. Dean Stockwell got his own cigar <laughs> shop in the afterlife. And you can give me money at patreon.com slash scathing atheist. Just in case. So I'm just paving the way. Just saying to take Bitcoin. You guys are really crushing it for vulgarity for charity this year. It's just, you know, it's almost <laughs> a, like do them first, but then afterwards, maybe I don't know. <laughs> Stupid. The guys yelled at me. And in showdown at the OK Corral News, Corral. Coral. It's about church. Mm -hmm. A prisoner family visit church service program in Oklahoma kicked a woman out while she was visiting her sister this week for attempting to smuggle in a bag of cilantro. <laughs> Real, oh. OK, excellent. Almost the same thing happened to me, except it was mint tea no shit and and also not weed almost the same thing happened to me except it was weed yeah <laughs> yeah okay so all right where do i begin on this all right first of all a church is in charge of family visitation at a jail in oklahoma that's pretty fucked up yeah this, what is the first part of this the church in question is the pen av redemption united methodist church and when ashley onteveros attended a service last week she brought menudo the 
traditional Mexican soup, not the boy band. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you yeah. for clarifying. I was so confused for a second. <laughs> I also had a moment where I was like, so they're named after the soup. Yeah, they're oh, named okay. after the Yeah, soup. they are. Okay. Apparently. She also brought <laughs> lime, oregano, and cilantro in a second bag for people to add as they wished. Oh, Jesus. However, when the church <laughs> saw wow. said cilantro, they kicked her out and threatened to call the cops because they thought it was weed. Okay. Oregano is actually used as fake weed sometimes. Cilantro is just the color green yeah, and does right, not and it has like weed. weed. The, uh, so the only outcome that would be just here is if they confiscated the cilantro and then smoked a joint of it when she left. <laughs> yeah, <it's> like, <laughs> I really don't see what them hippies are going on and on about. This is just unpleasant. Yeah. All right. Now you got to smoke the whole soup. <laughs> <We're gonna watch. laughs> got to smoke the whole boy band. <laughs> They're just pouring soup into one side of an apple. This is terrible. (laughs) So in the two videos taken by Ms. Antiveros, you can very clearly hear multiple church staff claiming that her cilantro is drugs. Amazing. A fact that the church did not address in their half-assed apology at all. Really? Where they posted on their website, quote, The video clip that is being circulated around social media of an incident that occurred at Redemption Mission Penn Avenue in Oklahoma City on November 14th is of a person who was upset because the staff did not allow her to give a bag of food to a family member who is an inmate attending the faith service. (laughs) No, no, no. It was you guys accusing her of having one of them crack limes. Tucker Carlson was talking about (laughs) not some wasted soup. (laughs) Incidentally, all those videos you see where people are upset about that kid in Wisconsin are from people who take curfews very seriously. (laughs) Issue there. Somebody invent the crack lime, though. I yeah, mean, oh, yeah, come for on. sure. But here's where it gets weird, okay? They then removed the half-assed blamey apology and replaced it with this quote. And really, really sit with this, because this, this has bothered me a lot over the last couple of days. Quote, volunteers at Redemption, many of whom are former addicts, are badged volunteers trained by the DOC <laughs> to look for particular ways in which contraband can be passed, including... Bringing in drugs with food, which has happened in the past. Maintaining a drug-free environment is vital for people who are in recovery, so these standards must be strictly enforced, (laughs) end quote. Oh, hey, Karen. Yeah, I'll give this pound of flour to Chad for you. No problem. Excuse me, senorita? Senorita, (laughs) is that a sprig of drugs? I will need to stop you. Okay, a couple obvious things we need to get out of the way here. Racist-ass church got caught telling a Latina woman there are super drugs. And they have a staff of former addicts who, it turns out, were addicted to cilantro in the clink. Right, yeah, that didn't right? know the difference between cilantro and weed. <laughs> or weed. You know, there's nobody addicted to weed in jail. Right. Fuck you. <laughs> Either way, probably shouldn't have churches in charge of prisoner stuff, especially if said church staff are doing lines of paprika in the back. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that, that sentence works with or without the word prisoner. Yep. Yeah, but it probably shouldn't have churches in charge of stuff. There you go. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Seriously, Google cilantro because you don't. You're not getting how <laughs> not like weed it looks. <laughs> and finally tonight, North Carolina Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson is a dangerous lunatic, and I mean like dangerous lunatic for the Republican Party that he's in. Mm. He's been trying desperately to get on our show with an escalating series of absurd bigot rants since getting elected last year. And he finally made it into our headlines a few weeks ago. But really, he was only mentioned so we could talk about the absurd responses to his rant by other people, which were even more absurd. And I think he got offended by that and took it as a personal challenge. So last week, he decided to, this is real, unironically rank the sexualities mm-hmm. that happened first place by the way was hetero couples second place was gay couples and those are all the types of sexual relationships that exist. really <laughs> his entire pitch to north carolina's republicans seems to be sorry for being black hope i can make up with it for the different prejudice we can team up on a different <laughs> i'm on your side for all the stuff except the me yeah okay <laughs> 
Right. That's his platform, though. That's real. <sighs> also, he eats badly, so he doesn't think his life matters that much. Oh, you know, Jesus he's really <laughs> meeting them where they are. <laughs> I don't want to say how accurate that is. So here's a quick rundown. Coward. Of Robinson's experience that, you know, qualified him to be a high-level state politician. Okay, moving on. I was He got <laughs> national attention for the first time in 2018 after attending a city council meeting in Greensboro, North Carolina. The mass shooting at Stoneman Douglas High School had just happened when this meeting happened. And Robinson showed up to the meeting to yell at the local government for even considering rescheduling a gun show until after the dead children were cleaned up. And his pro-gun rant went viral. So naturally, the fucking NRA rose up out of the floor and they were like, you're our black friend now. You you talk at our next (laughs) national meeting. And he did that. So, yeah, end of experience right there. But this is the Republican Party. So I guess I should also include two years of shouting homophobic and transphobic slurs occasionally as part of an event with other people there, mostly (laughs) probably by himself, just into the middle distance. I don't know. Also in the shower, (laughs) probably in the shower. Sometimes he probably harmonized it. I don't know. Also Robinson was the guy who figured this is very important. He's the guy who figured out that black Panther, it was actually just a plot by the Jews and the satanic Marxists. Those are his exact words. Again, his exact words, it was a plot by the Jews and Satanic Marxists to, quote, pull the shekels out of your Schwartz pockets. What? Yeah. Schwartz is uh, Yiddish, uh, a slur word for black people. He's black, so he can say that plus all the (laughs) anti-Semitic stuff built into that. Now, Keith, to be fair, that's true for Republicans and Democrats. The Democrats just say it's subtle, like, you know, hypnotize and dual loyalty. Yeah. No, the parties are pretty much the same when it comes to prejudice. That's <laughs> okay. Hey, now. Hey, now. <laughs> <sighs> so here's how Robinson ranked those sexualities. It was during a sermon. But here's the thing. I don't think he's a pastor for any particular church. It's not clear, but I get the impression he's like a freelance pastor for churches all over the region. Kind of like a studio musician, but for hate speech yeah. instead of music. Mm-hmm. So during a guest hate at Berrien Baptist Church in Winston-Salem, he started by complaining that kids might see two men kissing on TV and then he'd have to explain it. To why? And no, 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 no you would not. Regardless, he continued by telling a story that absolutely never happened. Quote, somebody asked me in the classroom one time, Oh, so you think your wife and you, you think your heterosexual relationship is superior to my husband and our homosexual relationship? To which Robinson responded by screaming, yes, we're better than you. And then he explained, he explained, that's because if you put a gay couple in one room and a straight couple in another room and then wait nine months, the straight couple will have three people in their insane room where you lock them instead of still only two people like the gay couple would have in their insane locked room. Ah, uh, yes, because all great relationships have the plot of the horror movie Vivarium. <laughs> <Is> that, sure <laughs> do. I hate, well, I hate to say it with Robinson, but three is more than two. So <laughs> math is on his side. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, obviously the ability to breed is irrelevant, but let's pretend that matters for a second. First of all, Plenty of gay couples are making babies. Idiot. And if that ever happens in Mark Robinson's side-by-side birthing cage contest area, he's going to lose his fucking mind when he realizes that's what happens sometimes. But more importantly, there's no chance Mark Robinson is getting live sperm from himself into a willing uterus. (laughs) There's none scenario where that happens. So many steps along the way would work out so badly. And just for the record, one other thing, if we're ranking it, hetero is dead last. I think we can all agree hetero is dead last. It's socially irresponsible. It's bad for the world. And it's just boring. It's a boring Thank you. sexuality. Yes. And for those who are wondering, by the way, it goes gay guys, lesbians. Nobody has a gender polycule by girl and her gremlin, gremlin husband, husband, yep. the normalized incest hashtag and then straight people. Okay. Yes, last. Hey, no, a quick before Eli baits me into delineating ways that I'm better than incest again. We're going to close the headlines <laughs> for the night. Heath, Eli, happy Thanksgiving, guys. 
stuffing. And when we come back, we'll watch people cutesy up a story about genocide. It's that time of year again. Time for our American listeners to endure dry turkey and dry company. And time for our international listeners to wish we'd shut the fuck up about our goddamn holiday. But we won't. No. Instead, we're going to use it as the focus for this week's God Awful Mini. So tell us, Heath, what will we be breaking down today? We watched animated hero classics, William Bradford, the first Thanksgiving short movie YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> it's the story of the first Thanksgiving as told by white Christian people. It's hypocritical race theory, the movie. Oh, nice. <laughs> well done, sir. And Eli, how bad was this mini? Well, if you were a voter in the 2021 midterms, <laughs> you yeah. will love this movie, apparently. It's a yeah. big <laughs> thing for you. Right, yeah. So, yeah, it's the story of the first Thanksgiving or, you know, wink, asterisk, whatever. So we're going to open up in Lincolnshire, England in 1607. Yep. And, okay, they had to reach so far for this. This was the last time a white Christian guy was persecuted. <laughs> 1607. <laughs> and not even that bad. Right. They just sailed away and it was like, okay, we st end of story, we stole a continent, so we're fine. Right. So constantly throughout this, they will be taking, like, that time we did crimes and and showing it through like black and white footage with the Schindler's List music in the background, <laughs> right? So, so this first time is when Bradford, the first attempt to make it to Amsterdam with the pilgrims, which is where they actually left from, but nobody knows that because they don't teach it to you in school. Well, right, because they were allowed to practice their religion as they saw fit in Amsterdam. Right. right. So the first time they just tried to fucking go. Like, no exit visas. No, no, they were just like, we have a ship now. This is ours. We're going to Amsterdam. Right, right. They were a caravan of refugees showing up at the southern border. Right. And as the captain that they had commissioned, like, sold them out, I was trying to read the actual true story of this. It's nothing. It's a nothing story. Yeah. But I was surprised we didn't cut away from this scene where he gets betrayed by the ship captain to, like, him breaking rocks in the cold, hard prison yard. <laughs> <laughs> I liked how the captain showed up, though. He he did a big waiting thing. So, like, they get onto the ship and they think they're doing it successful. They're on the small boat and they go out to the ship and then the ship starts going. But then some of the guys on the ship are like, wait a minute. And they open up a door to, like, the bottom of the ship. And this British official guy comes out and he's like, no, now you're in trouble. And they're all like, did you? wait in like the bilge the whole time so we do it just so you could do a big reveal Florida. why wouldn't you just stop us <laughs> reveal right away yes now let us all awkwardly load back into those boats exactly. yeah right <laughs> and go to shore right fuck and they hit and of course they have to have the guy go like rotten puritan and punch him so we can see the kind of you know persecution they were facing I'm just impressed they didn't make up a Puritan slur, right? Like, you damn puries. <laughs> <laughs> Please, sir, that is our word. <laughs> but when he punches him in the face with the giant bag of money, I enjoyed that. That was, so yeah, that was pretty was good. Funny. This is win me over. Yep. I was very happy with the movie at this point. So then we get the credits proper or second credits, I guess. And we jump to 13 years later. They're on the Mayflower heading to the new world. And William Bradford is narrating, oh, it's been a hard trip. Many of us are, I wanted one person on the boat to be like, hey, William, do you mind not narrating how much this thing you did sucks? We're all very hungry and thirsty. <laughs> it's very bleak. <laughs> it's a good thing I brought plenty of ink in a giant barrel to write this instead of packing more food. Right. Fuck you. Right. Yeah, exactly. And of course, they have to sell the lie. They're like, only the new world can offer what we seek, religious freedom. And it's like, no, 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 no. At this point, you're running from the fact that your kids are getting all Hollandy, <laughs> right. right? You are already allowed in Amsterdam. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> but we, what we learn here is that William is kind and humble and sets about resolving arguments when people try to throw that nice old man's jack overboard. Okay. 
I am so excited about the truth of this story because I was like, this is such a weird detail to put in. And apparently, like, a bunch of the Bradford histories focus on this miracle of the Jack. Let's hope this never means masturbating. <laughs> so what <laughs> happened was during the storm, the captain came down and he was like, hey, you guys brought a bunch of unnecessary construction equipment. Please throw it overboard so we don't sink. And William Bradford was like, no, I'm keeping my excavator in the bottom of this boat. <laughs> and like the captain said, the masthead crashed into like the bottom of the boat. And the way William Bradford tells the story, the problem he caused, he was like, great. Now we can use my construction equipment to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to fix the mast with an excavator. But the, yeah, they have it like a, a jack, like you would jack up a car to change a tire. Mm -hmm. They have like a big version of that. So they just jack up the boat in general to being fixed really wanted a shot of the guy underneath the boat trying to change the tire <laughs> <laughs> i also like how they made the evil guy here the evil boat guy who was like throw all your stuff overboard they represent him by vaguely italian accent <laughs> yeah the evil mm -hmm. guy. it's i love because like some of the voice actors decided to do accents and some of them didn't it was like acting in a sketch with heath at a certain yep. point, it was amazing. Yep. I do an amazing Italian accent. <laughs> You're doing that forever now. All the sketches are that accent. <laughs> That's the new Sarah Huckabee Sanders. I don't fucking care. Italian. <laughs> so, but then we get the whole land ho moment and they see America, the shining city on a hill or whatever. And the title card pops up to tell us it's we're in Plymouth and it's November of 1620. This, it's time for them to all set about signing the Mayflower Compact. <laughs> and again, <laughs> the pitch on this is so... So the Mayflower Compact, by the way, so a little history for those of you who missed it, is the pilgrims get there and they're, they're secular people or people who aren't fucking weirdo pilgrims. So they're like, oh shit, if we get to land, people might have our absolutely fucking crazy moral code. So we're going to make everyone sign to Super Best Friend Promise be a pilgrim on the new land we go to. Well, right, which is horrible. That's what actually happened. But the way they represent it here is like, everybody signed a pact that we're not libertarians. You have to yeah. promise that we're not going to be libertarians. <laughs> right. Well, and, and they, in the cartoon, they're like, oh, we're going to start a democracy and we're going to self govern, which is, of course, the sort of the bullshit origin story that we tell ourselves so we don't have to admit that we kind of stole that from the natives. But what they really did was they were like, hey, if, if it's a voting thing, we have a voting majority since we're all one big religious block. Let's just do it that way. That way we're in control of who runs the thing. And hey, to be fair, that's been working out for them ever that's since. That's true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So they're trying to convince everybody to sign the Mayflower Compact. And this is where we meet Miles Standish. I had him down as Tin Hat for quite a while in my notes. Oh, yeah. this I have him as Spanish Hat Captain. Okay, yeah. That's Miles Standish. That's the guy that they hired to like protect him or to, like, to do military shit. Who's just like, yeah, man, I'll sign your fucking thing. Whatever. Yeah. He's one of those Spanish people named Miles. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> but then to kick off their new democracy, they elect a governor out of the one candidate that runs unanimously. Yeah. So, so you know, <laughs> it's like a school board election. Yeah, right. No, it's democratic, like the People's Democratic Republic of North Korea. So... <laughs> That night, we get Williams and, and Miles. They're looking over the site of their future colony. Now, we should point out, it's like late November in Massachusetts. They're like, this is a great spot to start building our colony, huh? <laughs> and it's great because Miles Standish has this moment where he goes, there is plenty of water. And they're on a fucking beach. I wanted so badly for him to be like, well, yeah, no, the ocean. It's so salt. Can't. You can't drink that, though. Yeah. Why did we bring you? <laughs> I just appreciate him going to bed in his armor so that I would know which character he was from one scene to the next. That was nice. <laughs> Are you wearing the same armor as yesterday, man? That's, <laughs> that's gross. But so just then, so they're having this conversation where William is saying, well, you know, I'm going to make friends with the natives and i promise not to genocide any of them that's not what we're gonna do as a people here at all and miles is like i feel like we're gonna have to genocide them oh trust me you're gonna want to genocide them and the minute he finishes saying that racist indian noises attack yes oh god yeah right the indians attack and start shooting arrows at them 
But, you know, don't worry. They fire some guns in the air and the Indians don't know what to do about all of that scary yeah. stuff. The conclusion of this scene in this children's cartoon is, don't worry, those natives are cowards. We are the good guys in this cartoon. <laughs> yep. And the good guys are like, fire into the air only. Guns are very dangerous, but necessary for, you know, just scaring, but only into the air. Promise <laughs> so you for won't. self-defense, stand your ground, gentlemen. gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> it's our awareness of our own rights that will really scare them away. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so they said, they, they, and the voiceover comes up and is like, "We started building our colony on Christmas Day." I'm like, "Really? In Massachusetts, you waited till Christmas to start laying the groundwork." They got there. What were they doing for like a month and a half? <laughs> just, nah, I don't want to start yet. Well, let's like, just uh, let's just chill for a little. We just we, got do, here. we have to do all the paperwork. There's a lot of compacts to sign. I, no, I get it. Heath was in charge of their moving. Oh, kind of want to unwind. <laughs> So, yeah, so and, and then the narrator comes in and he's like, you know, hunger and disease had also run their evil course. About half of us had died. And I'm like, you've been there for a month. You guys didn't bring a month worth of food. <laughs> he also goes, sometimes we only have six men available to bury a body. And I don't know why I thought this and fixated on it so hard. I feel like you don't need six people to bury a body. <laughs> I don't like that you fixated so much, but yeah, <laughs> that, that is true. Roll probably. a die and see which one of me. It was kind of funny what happened though. Yeah. He's like, you only, <laughs> we only had six people to bury the dead. Okay, actually five. I just fell I down passed. and I died. Down almost down. died. <laughs> yeah. I'm writing this now, late, later, different. I'm narrating some other tense. <laughs> what? <laughs> Please don't animate me falling like a southern bell into Miles Standish's arms. <laughs> But yeah, and of course, he keeps trying to make friends with the Indians, but instead he just keeps getting wolves. That's such a weird shot. <laughs> That's <laughs> such a fucking... I try, the narration is, I tried to talk to the Indians and I wanted someone to be like, dude, William, those are wolves again, man. <laughs> those are wolves, bud. And they show, off the, they show us the wolves. They're so goddamn angry. They have like... <laughs> they give no fucks, these wolves. They have the best faces. It's fantastic. But he just walks out and looks at Clearly, a group of wolves is like, are there any Native Americans who want to help us? Or is that are you, are you guys? Do you guys know? Are you English speaking wolves that know some Native <laughs> Americans that would like to be friends with me? No, I wanted a wolf to be like, fuck you. Wear a mask. No, we're not helping. <laughs> well, and then he turns to Miles Standish and he's like, how will we survive with no knowledge of this land? And I'm like, you guys just now thinking of that? No, you show up in fucking Massachusetts late November. And now you think of that. OK, spoiler. Yes. Now is when they thought of that. <laughs> yep. But then we cut to that fateful day when a non-murderous native arrived. In real life, by the way, the way he disarmed them was by just asking for beer when he showed up. <laughs> they leave that out of the cartoon. <laughs> yeah, so this is pre-Squanto. And the minute he gets to them and starts speaking their language, they're like, do you know anyone who speaks better English? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. Might as well say which way to Times Square. <laughs> do you guys you guys have a guy who speaks English less racistly than you? Yeah, yes, you do. Why would we why would you send you first? Then? Kind of bad. Can we speak to the manager? Basically they asked to speak to the manager here. That's what <laughs> they really do. British people did here. Yeah. And they got Squanto. He's the manager. And they're to oh God, they're so rough. They're talking to him in that asshole thing where they think they're somehow communicating extra by using one word outside of their normal language. Like my GM at Fridays would do with Spanish. He'd be like, I need you to change mucho light bulbs to a Spanish speaking <laughs> person. And they'd be like, yeah, I'm fluent in fucking English. But don't, it's, don't say mucho now. It would be Just muy say light bulbs. English. It would be muy light bulbs, man. Come on. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, but so this, this guy, this native sets up a meeting between the pilgrims and one of the local tribes. Now, what this meeting was really about was like, hey, man, we know when you guys show up, you kill a lot of us. So uh, we're going to team up with you and maybe we could kill this other tribe over here instead, you and us together. Yes. But of course, the way they sell it in the cartoon is just like, hey, you guys want to be friends? Do you want to be friends? Check this box. Right. Yes. But we have the whole bit where they're getting ready for the meeting and damn it, the old governor guy doesn't want to wear a helmet. <laughs> yeah, it's weird the moments that this like white supremacist propaganda chose for comedy. Yeah, right, right. And the, the slapstick that they chose. But this is also where we meet 
Squanto, they are better English speaker. Oh, oh God. And Squanto gets in a good burn here, right? Because they come over and he's like, me, big man, he, small man. And Squanto's like, you're embarrassing yourself. Yeah, embarrassing <laughs> right. <yourself." laughs> it's just, I speak your, I've been to England, man. <laughs> oh, oh, one more thing I want to talk about by this scene that I love so much. When they sign their friendship agreement, they repeat this weird lie that's in a lot of history that he has no signature. No, it's not that he didn't have signature. He didn't write in English in quill pens. Right. Yes. Yeah, they not, didn't. He's like, no, we would settle agreements with gifts and stuff. We just have a different way. And instead he's acting like, what is this papier you speak of? <laughs> Am I supposed to eat this contract you just handed me? Right. Right. Yeah. No. Instead they bring corn and blankets. And I'm like, I bet their blankets didn't have any smallpox in them, did they? <laughs> oh, that's sad. Should have. Yeah. So, and then of course we get the scene where Squanto is explaining to him how that they're, they don't understand how to farm and it's really dumb that they didn't bring farm people with them. Yeah. He's fairly confused. Like I understand. He's like, you're really fucking bad at farming. Do you not have plants in England? What were you doing? <laughs> Did you, um, you have plants, right? Did you come here just so that you could have a really super crazy version of your religion that was already accepted where you were from? Oh, you did. Okay. Oh, all right. Well, now okay. all, yeah, oh, all of a sudden you're fluent in English and you know all these words. <laughs> Fuck you. And this is where the movie, and gentlemen, correct me if I'm wrong, took on a bit of a, I'm going to say hardcore Western yaoi vibe, right? Did you guys get this vibe between Squanto and... Uh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. There's a def the animators were definitely like hedging their bets on whether or not they were going to use this as underground gay porn. <laughs> it didn't get made... <laughs> Into a full-on animated short. Well, you know what? Look, when you read the history, like the, the did they or didn't they between William and Squanto is, is actually pretty, you know, it, it kind of it screams through the historical record. But it's also pretty fucked up because this is the part where Squanto has to tell his backstory, which is tragic and horrible, right? This is a guy who was kidnapped and enslaved and dragged halfway across the fucking world. And then when he finally got back to his homeland, his entire tribe had been wiped out by disease. Like it's, he was the last of his people to to survive, so it's this terrible fucking story. But they tell it like a you know you know like a little quick Disney montage. Yeah, like he went on a yacht from like yeah. Paris to, mm -hmm. and then he went into the Mediterranean a little bit. He went I, was, I, was, I saw a lot of different Checked capitals. Out Spain for a little bit. You know, Corfu is really nice. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I came back from studying abroad, my girlfriend was dating someone else. Yeah, <laughs> right. Who? But yeah, but he he decides that he's going to live with them from now on and be their buddies. That's the best part is they get to this end of this tragic story. And he's like, and I guess my conclusion is I really like white people and would like to stay yes. here. Right. And then we get this amazing like what you would imagine Eli singing to Cecil from the tree in his front yard song. It's yeah. But at gunpoint, right? Like Cecil has found me. <laughs> The scope is trained on me and I'm trying to get him to put the gun. We're the best of friends. How does Randy Newman do this? It's harder <laughs> than it looks. <laughs> I'm singing this song at Heath's funeral, by the yeah, way. Yeah, okay. All right. No, that's about. fair. Yeah. 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 Dips. You, you think you're going to outlive me? <laughs> Are you insane? I will if I murder you. <laughs> okay. All right. So... <laughs> But then you won't be allowed at the funeral. Yeah, no, that's true. Probably. Yeah. So it depends on how well you think you're going to get away with it. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm what I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say you were endangering me. <laughs> oh, <Jesus. laughs> All right. So yeah, but Squanto shows him some nifty not dying tricks during the the music. We have a little bit of slapstick. People fall down, and while they're standing up. It's very funny. They seem to be implying that England also does not have fishing nor tree sap. Nope. Because they nope. learned about both of those things existing here. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, this montage ends with John the Wacky Slapstick Governor collapsing and dying. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Up until this point, this guy's just been there to like, well, this hat doesn't fit at all, you know. But now he has a tragic death moment a la Yoda. 
I'm just smoking a spliff in front of my son. Yeah, this is what animated used to be like. <laughs> you kids in your fucking egg contanto or whatever. You don't know what it was like. We used to just have characters dropping dead left and right. We killed a deer's mom for no reason. Had nothing to do with the rest of the movie. Even he doesn't get revenge. Matter. Doesn't change him. He's just sad. <laughs> so- <laughs> All right, let's watch Frozen 2 again. You have good insurance, Dad? <laughs> So yeah, so now John the governor is in bed dying of need to move the plot along. <laughs> and there's this great moment where Squanto is like, this man is set to die. And then he immediately opens his eyes and I wanted to be like, wow, I'm sorry, did you say I'm trying to die? Because I'm very much trying not to die, Squanto. Just, you're very relaxed. Go onto the ice floor. Doing- <laughs> we don't do this. We don't do this here. <laughs> Stop. Get off me. <laughs> we have a bad understanding of death here. <laughs> so, yeah. So, Squano wanders, wanders off after having his sort of, there's nothing I can do. This is like we're going into final monologue moments right here. So, Squanto wanders off and John has to tell William that, like, you know, if anybody can <laughs> be the governor after he's gone, it's <laughs> William. Nailed it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, he has this he gets a great thing. He says, I shall die, but the colony shall live forever. And if you have any awareness of this colony's history, that's great. Cause like two years later, they start to starve to death and a bigger colony has to come down and be like, okay, you're technically part of our colony. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. You know, the state of, it's in the state of Plymouth. No. <laughs> yeah. I also, his timing was pretty good though, right? He gets to the end of his little speech and he just dies. Perfect timing, yeah. If, if I get one of those like deathbed type of diseases, I am going to pump fake on that so many fucking times. I'm going to gather people around and put in little coughs and shit, and then I'll just be like, also, could somebody grab me like the remote control? <laughs> that controller over there, I need new batteries. In this one. And then, okay, but then, uh, then we do some more democracy. William is elected governor with no other candidates by a unanimous vote. <laughs> Crushing it. <laughs> democracy is working great for us. We are all white men. This will work forever. Yep. Stop the count. Yeah. Well, we didn't need to. <laughs> Start the count. So, yeah, but and then William has his first gubernatorial proposal, Thanksgiving. So in the end the story of Thanksgiving was... Yeah, this guy figured we should eat food that day. Yes, and and to be clear, I don't mean it in a gluttonous way, in a gluttonous, sinful way that would drive us to the very fires of hell itself. I mean it in a fun way, you know? (laughs) There you go. (laughs) And then, of course, he goes, and uh, to be clear, Thanksgiving is explicitly religious. It's all about Jesus. I can say that definitively. It's like inventing an imaging format. I get to decide. <laughs> Somebody write that. Down. Send an email to No Illusions. Just uh, <laughs> make sure that's clear. And then, and then we close on him and Squanto about to kiss. Yeah. Well, all of the natives show up potluck style to the big dinner, and then yeah, him and Squanto looks. St- dreamily into each other's eyes and absolutely they make out here yes <laughs> no question. Yeah. i made out here i opened and tilted <laughs> all right well I, I apparently we have to wait for the sequel for willie and squanto to consummate that relationship so i guess that's going to do it for this installment of god awful minis angelo uh-huh. i will commission you for that ar- <laughs> just saying buddy i kn- I know you're stuck at home in Australia. We can make that erotica. <laughs> Hate to spoil it for you. It already exists. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> Before we take a crack at those leftovers tonight, I want to thank everybody who's made Bulgarity for Charity such a huge success again this year. Once again, we've extended the deadline to get an on-air roast all the way to the 29th, midnight on the 29th. So there's still plenty of time for you to add to that total and milk that match. We're already over a quarter of a million dollars. We're on the verge of breaking our $300,000 goal. And hell, by the time you hear this, we may be over that. And it's all because of you. Anyway, that's all the blast we've got for you tonight. But we'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be able to look out for a brand new episode of our Sister Show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday and an even newer episode of our Half Sister Show Citation Nita debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I can't finish the meal until I thank Heath Enright for being the stuffing of the podcast, Eli Bosney for being the mashed potatoes, and Lucinda Lusions for being the 
You know, I'm going to get in trouble if I use the gravy joke that I was thinking of. So instead, I'll say the sweet potato pie. I also want to thank Reggie the Turkey for providing this week's Farsworth quote. Sorry about your cousins, dude. And as weird as it is to use Thanksgiving as an excuse for not thanking people, I'm recording this in advance, so I can't thank any of the new patrons by name this week, but I promise I'll get you next week. And if you'd like to hear your name alongside of theirs, you can make per episode donation at patreon.com slash getting atheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad free version of every episode, or you can make one time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help with all your expendable income went to charity roasts, you can also help a ton by leaving a five star review, telling a friend about the show, and following at PIAT Pod on Twitter. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who will roll the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingadius.com. Fucking nut loaf. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved.